Joe Hague is starting. If you will, uh, Sergeant at arms, you'll have everyone come in the room. Have a seat. We'll, we'll have about two minutes we'll start. setting the time correctly, correct? <clears throat> okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is uh, Lexington County Republican Party meeting, Executive Committee meeting, July 2nd, 2012. And we're starting it's a few minutes late. But because of the length of the agenda, we uh, started a little early, or attempted to, we do have a forum, and we will begin with uh, invocation by our chaplain, Lyman Whitehead. Lyman. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we still have to come and gather and discuss things that need to be discussed. We ask that you be with us guide and direct us and be civil. We ask that you be with our military wherever they may be and what harm's way. And we particularly 
that God ask you the blessings of the three fallen heroes that were just put to rest this past weekend. Such a dastardly act against them. And we ask that we get to the point where we stop these bullies, draw a line in the sand if they come across, take care of them. This country needs to get back to good Judeo-Christian constitutional living and elect good Judeo-constitutional election for officials. And we ask that you guide and direct us to do the right thing, be with those that are not with us, be with the sick and the shut in. And these are all our many, many blessings. We ask that our great son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Officials, please stand. The uh, Senator Knotts, uh, Harry Harmon, uh, Bobby Great Digger Kiesler, Bobby, good to see you here. Uh, Dr. James R. Jimmy Mess, one of the outstanding law enforcement officers in the com country, uh, well known. Jimmy, thanks for being here tonight. And uh, Debbie Summers. And Debbie, no, Debbie, and I'm just very philosophical. I have a lot of respect for Debbie Summers. Debbie, thanks for being here tonight. Did I miss anyone? Harry, Harry Horn, Donnie, Donnie, Donnie Myers, Donnie, Donnie. Thanks, for, thanks for being here tonight. Okay, next, uh, I've got a couple of, uh, I want to make a statement about unification. We, we've had, all of you know this, we've had a, a primary, not a typical primary, but it's been historic times here in South Carolina. And I've got, my thoughts went on a little bit long, but let me, let me go through these thoughts with you. And I wrote these out hurriedly before I came. So this is the idea I have in mind of our party, not just here, but in the state and, and across the country, really, but, but particularly here in Lexington County. It's difficult to run for public office, made even more so with the recent ballot debacle. A few short months ago, Joe Wilson, sitting right over the corner over there, led an applause after I made the an announcement that we had a record 44 Republican candidates running for public office. I ask you to move forward at that time, and you did. The Republican Party is about individual freedom, freedom to choose one course, one's course in life. The Republican creed that was just read says, if I can seek opportunity, not security, I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. With the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding health care, more big government intervention, and greater regulation, it is harder to dream and build. For without risk, there is not freedom. The word freedom we are talking about is not the same freedom our liberal friends discuss. Our vision of freedom looks beyond what is here today. It builds a future of could and should be, of more opportunity, and honors those who have made our present freedoms possible. In contrast, our liberal friends continue to sacrifice freedom and dreams for security. This must stop and stop now. 
The litmus test is a question. Do words and actions match? Does rhetoric match the voting record? Oftentimes it does not. Even if an R is by an elected representative's name, it no longer guarantees that person is a conservative. We are going to change that over these next years. Now, I want to ask you this. This is something our state chairman did at the UNT breakfast last week. I want to ask you to put your differences aside. Let's come together in this conservative party, the Republican Party, and enable people to decide at the ballot box. The discourse heard by the public must be our long-standing conservative message. So I would like for all of you, all of those people who participated in the June 12th primary, those that, that are currently certified and, and those that participated and did not win, and those who are seeking to be a petition candidate now, come to front of the room and stand with me. Rich is energized from running in, running us in the primary January 12th, June 12th. Well, let, me, let me say this. Running for office is hard, even though in normal times. So these are not normal times. Rich Bowling is going to talk to you later about his analysis of the ballot debacle. And it's very good. It's well done. So I want you to look across this room. There are people who, who didn't win, who spent a lot of time, money, and energy to do the right thing. All the way across and still running. These are the heroes in this county, in this state. These are the people that make this country. This is where we put our faith. When we say we put somebody in office to be a conservative, these are the people we put our trust in. What I'm asking each one of you to do is, if there are petition candidates here, these are only, all these are members of the Lexington County Republican Party. That's all. These are members, good, solid, conservative members. We're not pitting people against each other. We're trying to give the citizens a choice, a conservative choice. So let's stand together now and let's give these people a round of applause. folks did is not easy and to move forward under these very adverse circumstances is not easy but they're doing the right thing and I, I don't have this written down but it comes to me now after standing up there at the end of that video that many of you have seen with Ronald Reagan he quotes the Churchill and he says there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space that's something whether we like it or not is called duty it's our duty. We feel it inside. Something that drives us, and that's what we've done. We're doing the right thing. So, next, I want to bring an issue up that most of you are aware of, and some of this is my fault for not being stringent enough, strong enough on certain issues. But I want to go over this. As chairman of the party, elected by the executive committee, I'm charged with maintaining order and decorum, and I will do that. Rule 2A states, states that the rules shall be interpreted and applied so as to substantially accomplish their objective. The spirit and not the letter of each rule shall be controlling. Substantial compliance with a rule shall be sufficient. Rule 5D8, the county chairman is the official spokesman for the Lexington County Republican Party and is the only person authorized to speak and act on behalf of the party. I will recognize individuals at the appropriate time. Raise your hand to be recognized. If time is limited, I will limit the debate to any particular issue. Outbursts without being recognized will be called out of order. If an individual continues disruption after a warning by the chairman, the individual will be asked to leave the room. Order and decorum and courtesy will be maintained. That is my responsibility and duty, and I will do that. 
Next, I just received a letter from our state chairman, Chad Conley. And let me tell you what's in response to. Several of you had sent questions in about uh, what we're about to go over now, this, uh, this petition candidate resolution. And I said, hey, Chad, give me your thoughts and reasoning as to why some counties have decided to pass the resolution waiving penalties against those Republican members who have chosen to support the Republican petition candidates. Also, what are your thoughts as chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party as to why we should suspend Rule 5E and allow Republicans to support Republican petition candidates here in Lexington County? Chad wrote back and said, uh, hey, Steve, thanks for your question about this resolution that many counties and the SCGOP are recommending, are recommending that all counties pass in this crazy election cycle. As you can tell and have experienced, this is an extraordinary year, and one in which our entire entire election process has turned upside down by interesting court decisions and conflicting state agencies' instructions, not to mention lawsuits, exclamation point. In light of the turmoil, and to be consistent with all that I have said and all the party stands for, I feel strongly that we should err and continue to err on the side of ballot access for the voters of South Carolina. No party supporting platform-centric conservative Republican candidate has anything to fear from us declaring that we are suspending our rules on this issue this year only. As long as a candidate can identify our platform from the newspaper they use to line the bird cages with, and they have typically supported conservative Republican issues, I don't see where anyone would have anything to be concerned with in regard to this resolution. I seriously feel this is no big deal and will pass unanimously in all counties that present it for consideration. I'd have to wonder about anyone questioning the motives here since Republicans have long stood for ballot access and voter choice. It is truly how we become a stronger party. Explanation point. Democrats may like to solve issues in the courtroom, but we'll keep believing that our ideas win at the ballot box. Thanks for all you're doing and thanks for let, letting me comment on it. Feel free to use this statement as you see fit. I may even send it around in case others are having similar questions. Tell anyone to have a great and blessed 4th of July. God bless Chad. That's a very clear, succinct uh, statement. Now, item number seven on the agenda, um, a resolution to support Republican petition candidates. The resolution, whereas state party rule 5E states, should any officer or delegate publicly endorse or financially support a candidate or partisan office other than duly nominated Republican candidate, comma, unless there is no Republican nominee in the relevant race, they should immediately vacate the Republican Party office, period. Whereas the state party rule 5E, 5 further permits the county executive committee may waive this provision for their county in less than county elections, whereas the state Supreme Court decision in Anderson and again in Forest County caused the removal of candidates attempting to run for office as Republicans, whereas Republicans believe in voters having choices at the ballot box, and those choice, choices should not be inhibited by court decisions. Therefore, be it resolved that the Lexington County Republican Party Executive Committee waives any castigations and or negative actions under SC GOP Rule 5E5 for any delegate or officer who publicly endorses or financially supports a petition candidate who attempts to file but was not certified in the 2012 Republican Party primary, period. This rule will impact 2012 election cycle only, period. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to uh, pass this resolution. So moved. We have a second? Second. Second. This is, this is the first reading, right? First reading. Uh, Make a motion to suspend the rules. Suspend the rules and do what? Uh, vote, vote for this vote for or against this resolution in this meeting. You know, it can already come up. I understand this under the point of order, and Mickey, please correct me if I'm wrong. Y'all have a rule that requires y'all to pass this at two consecutive meetings. Is 
that right, it takes two thirds votes to suspend it. So that's my point. Uh, whereas um, there's no real objection to it. It's, it's the first. Well, I, I completely then, then, then what you've done is not so much raise a point of order as just make a good point, and, and the point is well taken. There's no necess necessary to suspend the rules, not necessary. However, I will say this this would take a majority vote rather than a two thirds vote to adopt because of the way the state rule is phrased. The state rule phrases this as a waiver as opposed to a suspension of the rule, and as it does not state the vote requirement, the vote requirement would be a simple majority rather than a two thirds vote. My motion is to. To go by the rules and have this first reading only and put it up. There's already a motion on the table. And that would be what would happen automatically, so there's no need for a motion to do that. So you can go ahead and okay. take, take uh, the Okay. Uh, discussion? I'll give two minutes uh, to two people on each side of the issue. Uh, how about uh, give me, how about someone want to speak against this? Who would like to speak against it? I'm at the quick. The, the question like is. The point of order is not a point of order. This is not. Well, let me rephrase. You just didn't make a point of order at that point. And the, I think the point that you made is, is that we can't address it tonight. And the, the answer is, is that it, it can be addressed tonight. It has to be voted on two, two meetings in a row. And I understand the length of the county rules. So we can have pro and con, we just can't vote on it. No, there will be a vote tonight. And a, a second vote is required at the next meeting. And it has to pass both. Just like a county council, except two readings instead of three. So it will be voted on tonight, but it won't be done until the next meeting. Okay, who would like to speak against it? I'll take two individuals to speak against it. Raise your hand if you'd like to speak against it. Point where we have a motion to suspend the rule that it needs to be passed tonight. I think that's the point. That's in order to suspend the rule, we're going to have two readings. We have to have a two-third pass order. Perfect. Understood. And I would, I would, if I would advise the chairman to find that point of order not well tested for this reason. Uh, motion to or a rule requiring multiple readings is a rule in the nature of a notice requirement. Um, it allows people who might not be here at this meeting to come to the next meeting. And therefore, a, a suspension of that rule isn't possible because under Roberts is a rule protecting the rights of absentee people who are not here tonight. So I would I would advise the chairman to find the, the, um, the motion to suspend the rules and adopt it tonight on one reading that motion would be out of order under my under my view of things because the two reading rule is a rule in the nature of, of protection of absentees who are not here this evening. Nonetheless, um, a, a, if it is passed tonight, then it would still come up at the next meeting, and if passed in the next meeting, it would become effective. That's right. Didn't know, uh, it wasn't intended to pass in the first reading. The rules do require uh, two readings of this, so everything everyone's aware of that. So. Um, Again, someone would like to speak against it. Two I have individuals. A question. I don't, I don't want to speak, but I. Have oh, okay. A First of all, to be recognized, I'm asking. I've got a specific question here. Does someone want to be recognized to speak against this? That's my question. That's the only thing we're going to address at this point. Speak again. Yes, Mickey, you want to speak against it? Okay, Mickey, you have two minutes. First place on the surface, it looks sort of redundant. I mean, we don't support who we want to support. And we've never thrown anybody out of the party for supporting who we want to support. So it seems to me, um, whereas um, Chad Conley, our state chairman, admitted he wrote this in Senate, it didn't generate here. Um, I take exception to um, anybody, as the council will know, but in the Lexington County's business, but that's just my opinion. Um, it, it appears to me that. This is not necessary. We're all going to support who we want to support. We're all going to vote who we want to vote for. And nobody, in my opinion, is going to be thrown out because they've, um, under this, we may even could support a Democrat. I mean, this is pretty broad. So I, I, I think that, that this should, um, I speak against it, and I vote to um, temporarily postpone it. Anyone else want to speak against this? Thank you. Anyone else want to speak against it? I'll speak against it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Come on, come on down. Come, come down front to the microphone, please. Um, I'm Margaret Hamlin from Quill Hollow. Margaret? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to agree with Chad. I don't think it's necessary. I think 
there's a real issue if officers plan to present themselves as officers of the party in favor of one Republican candidate over another. And that was why I had a question because I think it might help if that were clarified, people might better understand really what the intent of this is. But I think not having all the information that you need, that's why I'm speaking against it because I don't think people really know um, the, the full parameters of this. When you think about it, the election in November for many offices in Lexington County is in essence the election that would have been held on June 12th. And because certain candidates were not certified and not able to speak and not able to get on the ballot on June the 12th, now we are in essence putting those races forward until the November general election. And it's one thing I think for an individual on their own to go out and get involved in a race but I think it would be dangerous and a bad precedent to be set for, say, somebody who is an officer of the party to present themselves as an officer of the party taking sides against one of two Republicans. So that's why I have an issue with this. I don't ever remember before um, people getting involved in races between two Republicans, and that's what we have here. It's just a different situation. I signed a petition. I mean, I've only had one person ask me, so it's not like I'm trying to deny access. I don't really see where this has anything to do with ballot access, because if you want to help somebody have ballot access, you need to be signing all these petitions. That's how they're going to get on the ballot. They're not going to get on the ballot by you saying, I can endorse somebody or I can give them some money. Amen. Um, if, if, if I may respond to that just briefly. Um, what you technically did was a parliamentary inquiry rather than speaking in debate. So that does not count as one of the debate well, spots again. I mean, I did say I was that well, right. And let me please clarify here from a rules standpoint. This is merely a rules point. This actually relates only to Rule 5E5 of the state party rules. It has, it has nothing whatsoever to do with a rule relating to officers endorsing as officers. This, this, if passed, would only suspend the application of 5E5. It would not authorize an officer of the party to endorse someone as an officer of the party. This, this document, yes ma'am, that's exactly right. This document does not do what you have stated you're concerned about. It, it absolutely does not, just to clarify. Well, well since uh, Margaret uh, went off on the top, I'll allow one other person to speak. Point, point of information, could, could we have Rule 5E specifically read? It, it is in the, it's the very first paragraph? Yeah, it's the first paragraph. All right. Okay. We would, uh, since Margaret didn't really uh, directly address 5e5, let's have one other person who would be willing to speak against it. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Mickey, hang on. We need to, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. State party or the county party rules are not applicable. This is not a change to the county party rules or the state party rules. This is actually a mechanism the state party rules authorize. Rule 5E5 states that the state or the county can waive by motion the application of Rule 5E5. This resolution would waive by motion the application of that rule and is therefore authorized by the state rule. This is not an amendment, it's an actual something you can do. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Would? Anyone else willing to uh, speak against the, this? I'll give one other person an opportunity to speak against it. Okay, uh, uh, we need two people to speak for it. I just have another question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes uh, ma'am. As I read this, it, it's my understanding we are only waiving the state party rule. We still have the county party rule. Is that correct? Is the county party rule, would the county party rule still be in effect? Because I do not see anything that talks about the county party rule here. Well, this, this does 5 5 is just a state party rule. Any other rule would have to be dealt with separately. So, so I mean... It, Mike, is there a county party rule that says equivalent to 5 5 I don't know. I haven't seen it live. I believe, I believe that there is. I don't have a copy right here. Uh, what's, what's the number? The closest thing we have is rule 5 Rich, if you don't mind, would you read 5 7 of the county party rules? person holding an official party office above the precinct level, 
is that what Mr. Bowen just read doesn't have any application to this situation at all. The only, the only rule that has application is Rule 5E5 of the state party, which is the one to be suspended. Okay. Very good. Okay. Two people speak in favor. Who would like to speak in favor? Suzanne? consider this because as a petition candidate I happen to be one but before I'm a petition candidate I was a Republican nothing has changed since the petition the issue came about I've been a lifetime Republican a longtime Republican and I look to each of you and I hope you recognize me as such I am proud to be here in this presence and I'm delighted to call myself a Republican. As I go, have gone throughout the county and gotten signatures on my petition, people will ask me, are you a Republican? And I said, yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. And I have some people say, well, I'm a Democrat, but I believe that you need to be on the ballot. I, need, I believe that you need to have, we need to have a choice in Lexington. We have no choice now unless we do get on the ballot. As a party, I appreciate your consideration of this resolution or this waiver. And um, some people in here, uh, Ms. Lindler, for instance, does not believe that, has stated in the, in the newspaper, in the Chronicle recently, <laughs> that as a petition candidate, I'm not a Republican. <coughs> and I'm sorry, Mickey, I've been a Republican. I haven't been a Republican as long well as you have. I I have been um, a Republican my entire life. And although Ms. Leonard okay. is uh, somewhat I'll, older I'll than I am. I have to sustain Mickey's point of order. <laughs> I, I have to sustain, I, I'm sorry. I have to sustain her point of order for it to Ruth. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I, as petition candidate, I'm proud to continue speaking this evening to you Sue, and Sue, asking you to support. Sue, I'm sorry, do I have to stop speaking because you're not a voting member. Only voting members have speaking privileges unless that rule is suspended. Uh, no, the, no, the, uh, there's a motion on the floor to suspend the rules. Is there a second? Second. All in, all in favor? All in favor suspending the rules? All, all in favor suspending the rules stand up. Don't make a look. Which rule are we suspending? <laughs> No, it was the rule to which we were referring. The, head of the, 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 the rule that is under consideration suspension is the rule against non-members addressing the body. Okay, so all non-members can address the body and have full... Uh, the, the expansion of that uh, this decision for this one instance uh, using the inductive reasoning process is not applicable here, Mike. <laughs> Out of order. Out of order, Ms. Okay. Does you all in favor? Let's count the vote. Don't give the count. All in favor? All in favor? All in favor? Okay. Have a seat. Have a seat. And all, all opposed stand up. All opposed stand. Okay. Well, that's clearly. No, no, I don't see anyone standing. Oh, we got one. One person opposed. Two. Two people opposed. Okay. The rule is suspended and uh, Suzanne Moore may move forward with her commentary. Time's up. Okay. Okay. No, you do not. You do not. That's not true. That's not a true statement. You do not. And you need to be recognized by the chair or I'll call you out of order next time. I just want to say thank you for all of you listening to me tonight. I'm proud to be a petition candidate, but most importantly, I'm proud to be a Republican. I'm proud to stand before you tonight and I ask that you support this resolution. Thank you very much. Yes, sir.
that if someone is an officer above the precinct level and they donate money to a official candidate, does, does that mean that absent this resolution, they would have to immediately take care of the office? That is correct. And if this is passed and a county officer donates money to a petition candidate, a, a very specific petition candidate, one who attempted to file wasn't certified as a Republican primary election, doesn't open it to Democrats, but a very that very specific application, that person would not be thrown out of office if this is passed. And again, I, I specifically said that that only applies to party officers above the precinct. Well, I, I think we're getting a little confused as to what we're talking about. As it stands right now, That's what I'd like. as it stands right now, any person involved in the party in any way would be thrown out of the party entirely if they sign a petition, well, probably not if they sign a petition, but if they donate money or support a petition candidate in any way, shape, or form. If this is passed, that doesn't happen. Right, turn out the office. Okay, uh, do we have anyone else in favor of supporting this resolution? One more call. Anyone else in favor of supporting the resolution? Mr. Chairman, may yes, um, District of Kansas brought up a good point here. Um, in the last paragraph, that it's endorsed uh, third line there, towards the end, financially support a petition candidate who attempted to file, I would ask that we would insert the words, as a Republican, but was not certified in the 2012. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Green, I would advise the chairman to ask unanimous consent to make that amendment. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to make Mike Green's amendment to the resolution. Do I have a motion? Approve it? Nobody objects? Okay. So it is, it's amended. It is amended. To add the words, as a Republican, after attempted to file. Okay, one more person in support of the resolution. Anyone else want to speak in support of the resolution? Okay, come on up, Andy McCain. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, just, just real quick here. My name's Eddie McCain, and uh, I started out as a Republican candidate for House Seat 39, which is basically Western Lexington County, Gilbert, Batesburg, Leesville, Summit, Fairview and most of uh, Saluda County. Uh, got a phone call one day letting me know that uh, I was no longer a Republican candidate and that my options were to be a, become a petition candidate. I did not volunteer to come off the Republican ballot. Okay, I was taken off the ballot. And the reasoning why I believe we should, we should amend this and allow members of the Republican Party to openly support petition candidates is because the petition candidates followed the directions of the Republican Party from the state level all the way down to the county. And when we walked into Shoney's to file, there was a checklist. I didn't write the checklist. It came from the Republican Party. It was sitting right there on the table. I'm fortunate enough that I got a snapshot of it on my iPhone, and I'm going to read it to you. Top part says candidate checklist. I'm a candidate. This is my checklist. That's how I took it. That's how you would have taken it. On here, underlined in darkened black capitalized letters, it states, file your statement of economic interest online only. Now what does that tell you? Does it tell you to file it online and go turn in a paper copy? No, it says file online only. And that is what we did. We followed the directions that were handed down to us by our Republican Party leadership. It just so happens the directions were wrong, but it's not at our fault because we were doing the same thing you would do. We were following the directions. I've got a picture of it right here. I'm glad to show it to you. Um, these are unusual times. I understand that. Uh, I don't believe one petition candidate out here wishes 
to become a petition candidate. I didn't change my mind. I didn't call uh, Steve Eisenberg on the phone and say, hey, bud, I changed my mind. I'm not going to be a Republican. I'm going to go out and get thousands of signatures and become a petition candidate. I didn't make that conscientious decision. I was taken off the ballot, even though I followed the directions to the T that was handed to me. So the only option that I had was to take, was to, not to run the primary, but to, um, I'm past my time. I'm past my time. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you listening to me. Okay, uh, Chair, we entertain. Okay, let's let's uh, entertain a motion to approve. Okay, I'd like to have a. Uh, everyone stand in favor of this Mr. motion. Chairman, I have one question. One question. Everyone's Mike. Mike, go ahead. I just want to make sure that we do this correctly. And as I read the second paragraph there, the county executive committee may waive this provision for their county and less than countywide and less than county elections. So. My question would be, is multi-county uh, candidates, would they be included in this? The language that I see says county. Mr. Green, that's an excellent question, and here is the answer. Thank you. My understanding is, well, let me back up a bit. State Party Rule 5E5 authorizes the state party to suspend the application of this rule for statewide and multi-county offices. And it authorizes the county parties to suspend the rule for county and less than county offices. And my understanding is that the state party is going to consider a resolution identical to this at their next meeting for multi-county offices. So to answer your question, this is as far as the Lexington County Party can go, but I understand the state party is going to take this up. Whether they'll pass it or not, I don't know, but they are going to take it up. I hope that answers your question. So some of the Senate races would not be covered by this if they're multi-county, like this county jersey. That is absolutely right, although since the state party has this motion pending, um, that answer that answer will have to come from the state Republican Party and not the Lexington County Party at the state's next meeting. Call the question. All, all in favor, stand up. Okay, all, all opposed, or sit down, all opposed, stand up. But I see Ms. Ellis voted again tonight for Quail Hollow, but I'm here for Quail Hollow, and she doesn't get a vote for Quail Hollow, and I'm here. Okay. The motion passes. Next, we have a, a special treat. This is actually uh, the main featured speaker for tonight is the Honorable Curtis Loftus, Jr., our South Carolina State Treasurer is here. Curtis is going to come over to the town, and he is working on something really important. I know we think this is really important, it is, but he's talking about billions of dollars of retirement savings, potentially. Curtis, welcome. Welcome. Y'all, I'll take notes. Part of my 10 minutes to say that I am the treasurer, I'm a politician, and I'm on everybody's side here. I will vote with anybody who gets up. I have nothing but universal love as I'm with all of you. <laughs> uh, th thank you for having me here. I knew there was a lot going on, but I've been a bit uh, removed from it. The treasurer's office is kind of a transitional office, you know, a transactional. I deal uh, a lot of in the weeds with things, and so many of these events that uh, are very important to y'all, as well they should be, I just don't see myself. You know, people will ask me about it, and I say, you know, if I can't be involved with all of it, I just won't be involved because I'm busy. Uh, the treasurer's office has been a lot of fun. It's a great honor. I didn't realize how much work it was going to be. I knew it was going to be a lot of work, but I had no idea how much work. I can honestly say I might be making minimum wage now, which is, I think, as much as I ever made, but I won't complain. Uh, I've had a good time being involved, or I've had a, a lot of time involved with the Investment Commission. And the reason we're here is we've talked a lot about the Investment Commission, and I've made it very important to go around and talk about a couple things that don't make the newspaper. One is the ranking file staff. We have a good staff. Those of you who have worked in government, those of you who have been around large sums of money or large organizations, know that lots of times the problem is not with the rank and file person. Lots of times it's with the leadership. And we've had a leadership problem. When I go over there, I could probably go there. I may go back after work. There'll be people over there working. It's 27, 30, 35, 40-year-old folks with families at home. They work hard. And why am I here telling you this? Because they pick up the bad rap. 
for the leadership question. Now, what we've got when it comes to transparency is we've got leadership that says that nobody can read the contracts that bind you as taxpayers. Nobody can read them but the select few people. My lawyers can't read them. My financial advisors can't read them. My chief of staff can't read them. The governor's lawyer can't read them. Alan Wilson, the chief legal officer of the state, can't read these contracts. We have many contracts. Well, we have half a dozen that are over a billion dollars. Not a million, but a billion dollars. And we have one that will total three billion dollars. And they're trying to tell me Roxanne's boy can't read that contract. How this works is that by keeping the power, I mean, keeping the knowledge close, they keep the power. And so we're going to go before the Budget Control Board because I thought it was, it was necessary for me to let the Budget Control Board know what I found out in the last year. And what I found out was that the onerous interpretation, and I believe the misinterpretation of these contracts, keep us from providing oversight. Now, you've all watched the Senate, and you've watched the House, you've watched your county council argue over very little. One time we argued over a $70,000 light pole at South Carolina State and the Budget Control Board over two different months. 70000 bucks, And we have $25 billion, bigger than the state budget. And we manage that on a daily basis, and we have no oversight. So I've taken my petition to the Budget Control Board. I sit on that board, and there are four other members. We're going to meet on the 12th of July, and we're going to hear all this out. I hope that we're going to reach compromise in the largest problems with confidentiality. I hope we'll reach a compromise before then. But if we don't, I'm more than happy to let, let, let the uh, assembled board make a decision. People forget that it's your money. Those of you who pay into it by way of contribution, if you're a government employee from the city level, county, state, it doesn't matter. And also, as a taxpayer, you're the backstop. We went from two, in the year 2000, we didn't owe any money. We were effectively fully funded. Now, 13 years later, we owe $14 billion. I want you to think about that. If the General Assembly had said, we're going to put a $14 billion debt on you, a billion dollars a year, there would have been an uproar. But because there's no oversight, because nobody understands what they do, they were able to pass that through. And that's what's happened. We made some meager changes. Or the General Assembly made some meager changes. Yeah, the retirement situation this year, that was good. They should have done more, but it was good that they started. So that's, that's, that's good. So I want you to know that in the next week or two, you're going to be hearing a lot about the Investment Commission. It does involve you. You are the backstop. You're the people who have to pay the bills. And many of you are the people who get in retirements. And as your state treasurer, I have an unusual view. I've been a member of the Budget Control Board. I'm a trustee. We hold the trust. We own the assets. Nobody else does. We have a 401D federal trust that's given to the five of us. I'm a member of the commission where we vote. We go and vote on these investments, and the commission staff works for us. But what really is taking my, temp, my time and my attention is that the treasurer is the custodian. And as you know, the custodian is the guy who's responsible for safety and security of that money. I'm responsible for the reporting, and we've fallen down on that. And that's why I've been at Loggerheads. I appreciate that everybody in this room tonight feels strongly about what's going on. I feel strongly about the issues I'm involved with, and I think we're going to be able to work them all out in the next two weeks. Let's hope. Otherwise, it'll be a real funny group. We'll have a similar situation there at the board, but I'm prepared for that. It's all about transparency, and it's all about accountability. I can promise you this. 90% of the troubles that I see every single day, and I see troubles you've never heard of, 90% of those troubles go away if we have transparency. The ones who hide it are the ones who have lost to hide. And that's just how it works. And uh, I hope to get this investment commission behind me in the next two weeks because i got a bigger fish to fry, to be honest with you. I've been studying something else as well. And we've got even, uh, we have substantially the same problems at another place in state government. There's no end to the problems that we have. And transparency will solve them all. I'll finish with this. The reason I picked certain battles, the reason I get involved with these bigger, and, and I'll just call them bloody because they are, it's because nobody else will do it. And what I find is the reason they won't is because the winners and the losers get bloody. And our elected officials let you down every day. They won't fight the big battles. And that's what matters. I sit there in my office and I hear this conversation. I see it in the media. I see it in rooms like this all over the state. And I'm thinking none of this 
is involved with what we are supposed to be doing on a daily basis. The treasurer has a lot of responsibility. People always say, well, you're going to run for another office. You just have a stepping stone. I can tell you, if I stay in this office the day I die, I won't be finished. Because the way we treat your money as a state is abominable. It's a shame. It's a sin. The Comptroller General, the Governor, the Lieutenant Governor, Alan, who I know works a lot of hours, we all have jobs that we can't finish. And yet we want to talk about other things. Let's remember while we're here. We're conservatives. We believe in smaller government. We believe in leaner government. But we believe in a government that works. And I remember when Joe was not yet in office. I remember Lyman and Nikki when there was 10 or 15 of us in the old courthouse. And I was 16 or 17 years old. Andre Bauer sleeping on the bench in the back. Only after you sold us candy and twice the markup. <laughs> I remember our pledge is that we're going to have a good, efficient, and lean government. Let's remember that whatever we do to now, tonight, whatever y'all do, I'm not a voting member, thank goodness I get to skate out of this without any trouble. But whatever y'all do tonight, remember this. It's got to be down to the people we serve. If it doesn't benefit the folks out there who pay the bills and whose rights and privileges we trade every day as our officers, as their officers, if it doesn't benefit them, we're wasting our time and theirs. So try to keep that in mind. Good luck. I'll be praying for you all as I skate through here uh, with, with those skin off my back. Um, like you said, I've known you since you were 16 or 17 years old. And if you said I had on a red blouse, I checked the make for I'll check to see if it's really black. I appreciate you and your efforts. Thank you very much. Um, the question is, have you succeeded in calling for a special meeting of the board? And is this on the agenda? It is. We're having a special meeting. The governor called it for the three, it's at three o'clock. Because I'm going to be in Portland, Oregon, doing due diligence with the commission. i got to fly back through the night to get here. But we'll all be there. But the hope is that with the deadline and the board there, we're going to compromise all this. I won't get everything I want. They won't get everything they want. But the taxpayers and the account holders will get enough to make them whole. And that's what's at least about. you'll know what's happening. That's right. There's going to be a lot of news on this the next two weeks. Y'all will be surprised that much of what comes out. But you'll see what I was fighting. You'll understand it. And I know I'm out of time, so I'll go. But I think you'll all be pleased to how this is going to work. And again, it all starts here with y'all. Y'all are the ones who decide who, who you elect. They're the ones who decide who you keep in office. Y'all are the most important. Folks like us, I get a paycheck. Can you believe that? Y'all don't get paychecks. I get a paycheck. So I appreciate what you do. Thank you very much. In this meeting, is the state auditor will be involved? Uh, probably not the state auditor. Uh, we'll have members from the commission, member from the treasurer's office, and then the five but, uh, other four members of the board and their staffs. And there'll be a, there'll be a whole bunch of lawyers. There'll be a lot of lawyers making money. Every, every one of the lawyers will be on the uh, Senator Knotts has, has a question. Yes, sir. Colonel Sasser will tell you, I thank you for the way you fought and stood up for the taxpayers up there when you came to the Senate. And we started out with... Uh, practically no votes and I played that vote whenever we ended up uh, uh, with your help and uh, the help of the Senate up there we wanted uh, what was it one vote or two votes no we started uh, off I mean we're gonna lose that vote probably 35 to 10 we won that vote 35 to 10 35, 35 to 10 thanks for you thanks for you know it was the funniest thing people that I that aren't known for voting that conservative way across the state they all came in. They understood that we needed to have a public official, an elected official, stand and watch all. We hadn't had that in all cases, and that's what makes the difference in here. Because I can get to the media. We've gotten to the media. We're going to have big changes. I'm over time, but I want to thank you. Had, you had some good staff up there, too. Thank you, sir. We won that. We started off going to lose that, and we won that. And in fact, we won four subsequent votes. That's a right. One named senator that was after me. We won every one of them. Thank you very much thank, for being thank here. You, got a resolution and Lee candidate is going to come and read the resolution and trip you some we have half, half or maybe a third of our steering committee members there in uh, Curtis's office and we were listening to some very detailed discussions going over my head Lee will come up and read the resolution this resolution in favor of transparency supporting uh, Treasurer Loftus's efforts okay a resolution in favor of transparency uh, 
Whereas the people of the state of South Carolina, being sovereign in their status as citizens, and therefore entitled to be fully informed as to the actions of their representative government and its agencies in all matters, and whereas elected representatives' first and foremost duty is to fully and truthfully report to the people and providing oversight of the government, and whereas South Carolina State Treasurer Curtis Loftus is being restrained from speaking the truth regarding fiduciary matters that are handled by the state and are of direct concern to his fellow citizens, therefore be it resolved that the Lexington County Republican Party does hereby express its utmost support for Treasurer Loftus and other elected officials who will dare to fight for the people in providing transparency on and oversight of all government functions and urgently calls for more citizens and their elected representatives to come to their aid. All in favor, stand up. Okay. It's passed. Curtis, thank you. Thank you very much. And I will tell you, we've got a good parliamentarian. He's already asked me to insert a break here shortly, so we'll do that. I like him. <laughs> uh, he's going to charge some money for this, so we've got to pay a little bit. But Rich Bowling, Rich is going to come forward and give us an analysis of the South Carolina ballot debacle. And I will tell you, Rich sent me a, uh, I heard about this from someone who had heard his presentation. It's fantastic. He sent and asked it for some editorial suggestions. I read it, and there's only a couple of changes, and um, other folks have read it. This is a very good analysis. So listen, listen to what Rich has to say. Rich, thank you. Thank you. All right, this is just like a history lesson and kind of an ex legal explanation of what actually happened. There's been a lot of misinformation. I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, if you're too stupid to get on the ballot, you're too stupid to hold the office. And that is completely wrong. That is completely wrong. And the reason we hear that is because this whole thing is a mess. Um, you heard about the SCI and the SIC. Let me tell you how, how those interplay and then where the problem came. Um, the SEI, the Statement of Economic Interest, is a form that's designed to show conflicts of interest that any office holder may have in their dealings with the state, separate from their job, so that you can see if they're selling property to their business or getting contracts for their company or whatever. And that is obviously a, an essential bit of information we want to have. That came from Operation Lost Trust back in the early 90s. That um, original law required that an SEI be filed every year by every office holder by April 15th, just like our taxes, for the previous year. Um, that law stayed the same pretty much until 2010, when the law was changed. And um, that new law said the SEI, and incidentally, as part of the ethics, Law, there's a there's a campaign filing requirements, the disclosures that we do every quarter as candidates, as long as we have an active account. Well, the new law said you had to file all that online, and they eliminated the forms, effective January 1st, 2011. And the first cycle that used those was election cycle was this year. So, in order to become a candidate, there's a separate code section, Title VII, which says you have to file an SEI or an SIC, a statement of intention of candidacy in paper, along with, um, well, the, 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 the section that requires that you file the SEI at the same time is in, this, in the same section, the financial section that has the SEI in it. In uh, section 1813, 1356, it requires that you file both the SIC and the SEI simultaneously, or they use the words, at the same time. So when the law was changed requiring only electronic filing, the law that said you had to do them at the same time was not changed. And that's a very common event. That happens all the time with new law. The legislature passes a law and doesn't realize how many other laws are impacted by a minor change in some, let's say, um, DSS law. We don't realize how it affects us in the criminal section or in tax sections, the domestic law, divorce law areas. So there's all, all kinds of occasions for a, a new law to conflict with an old law. And it's very common, and we as attorneys know that when that happens, the new law implicitly repeals the section of the old law that contradicts it, so that you can somehow harmonize it. And you only repeal as much as you need to to make it work. 
the assumption is that the legislature knew there was this conflict and they meant to repeal the section that conflicts with the new stuff. So that was the premise that everyone used for this section or this, this election cycle. Most of the uh, people that were involved in this, including the State Ethics Commission, the State Election Commission, the Democrat and Republican parties, and all the county equivalents, all had that understanding. That was standard procedure. Even lawyers all thought that's how this, the court would deal with it. And so everyone was told, just file online, and prove that you filed online, and file your statement again. It makes perfect sense. So we all thought that going into it. And all of us, and if anyone tells you they expected this to come out the way it did, they would be telling you they expected that uh, Obamacare ruling as well. Because <laughs> it was a shock. When we heard that, we as attorneys heard the Supreme Court said, oh no, there's no problem, just follow both, just follow both laws. Because, as a matter of fact, the day after they said that, that was May 1st, they said you got to follow both laws. On May 2nd, the attorneys came back and said, um, I hate to point this out, but there is no paper form. How should we resolve that issue? And they said, the Supreme Court said, oh, yeah, um, because there's no paper form, just print the screen and that'll be good enough. And so, obviously, most people, present company accepted, didn't think of that. I, when I read the law, I knew there was a conflict, and I didn't know how it was going to be resolved. So I printed the screen and filed them both at the same time, even though I was not required to do that, um, because I knew that was a, at least an issue. Um, at the time, I think I told Mickey, you can just throw it away if you don't need it, but I'd rather file it than not have it filed. Um, so when, when the lawsuit was filed, it was filed by a private citizen against Lexington County Republican Party, Dem Lex Lexington Democrat Party, the state Republican Party, the state Democrat Party, the Ethics Commission and the, or the election, the election election commission and the state elections commission, but not one candidate was sued, not one candidate was told, you might lose your rights. Um, and the reason I mention that is because it comes into my explanation of the decision. The Supreme Court, when they made their decision, surprised everyone. And frankly, they could have done a bunch of other things. Um, and that, that's what I want to spend the next few minutes explaining what else they could have done. Um, they could have done what I refer to, and Ty can correct me if he disagrees with my analysis, but they could have used equitable stop to say to the state, you cannot take people off the ballot because you acted wrongly. The idea is that you can't take advantage of your misdeeds over someone you're in the suit. So in other words, you can't tell the guy you're racing against, if the course goes over here when it really goes over there, and then you run, he goes that way, and you go the right way, and you win. You can't take advantage of that. And the court could have said to the court, to the election commission and the parties, you can't tell people to do their own thing and then punish them when they do what you told them to do. That would have been one way to solve the problem. Alternately, they could have said that um, to take people off the ballot without giving them notice is a violation of their due process rights. Because under our Constitution, state and federal, you have the right to defend yourself when you're about to lose rights. Being on a ballot is a property right. And the court should have or could have said, you can't take away people's rights. We're not going to take away all these candidates' rights when they don't even have notice that it's going to happen. But that didn't happen either. And all, another alternate theory is that they could have said, we can't make a law now, May 1st, that would be effective March 16th, which would be two months earlier. That's commonly referred to as an ex post facto law. And the U.S. Constitution, the state Constitution, both prohibit that. So the state could, have, or the Supreme Court could have said, "Sorry, we can't rule. We can't throw all these people off and make a rule that would be in effect in the past, and then punish people who didn't comply with the law they didn't even know about." Um, and uh, the reason I'm, I'm putting this all out there is because I'm just tired of hearing people say that they're that people who couldn't file right are too stupid to be up on the ballot. So I just want to explain that to you. That's kind of a abbreviated version of what I've written here. Um, and it's clear that there's plenty of blame to go around. The law was not written very well. The legislature should have said that uh, 1356 was amended to allow filing online with proof of filing or something. There's plenty of easy ways to fix it had it been addressed. Uh, of course, the Supreme Court could have ruled as I described. And of course, the executive you know, branch could have said, we're not really sure, just to be safe, do both. So there's plenty of blame to go around in the government. Um, 
problem is the only people that suffered as a result of all this blame are the candidates and the voters. So uh, I just wanted it out there so people would have an idea that it's not because people are stupid. When 240 people get thrown off the ballot, they're not all idiots. Frankly, I'm not sure if any of them are idiots. I'll leave that for you to decide. <laughs> Finally, as a, uh, as a resolution of this situation, in my humble opinion, I think it would be a gesture of goodwill and uh, maybe some penance if the legislature called an emergency session, passed a law that said you cannot have straight ticket voting mm -hmm. in the November election. The governor could sign it. Governor could sign it, and, and Alan Wilson could take it to the Department of Justice, and I'm confident they would approve it in time for the November election. And that would at least show the legislature is taking responsibility, the executive, the courts, they're all taking responsibility for this mess up that only seems to impact the voters, only hurts the voters. All the, all the responsible parties skate and have no consequences. And it seems like that solution would be a very simple and magnanimous way to say, hey, we're sorry we screwed up. We really do mean to represent you and give everyone a fair shake, and uh, we're going to do this. So I'm, uh, I'm going to advocate that you all get in touch with your, your uh, representatives and ask them if they uh, could make that happen. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you. of a previously filed document does not constitute a file. Well, if you use a the standard print. language of in, in the, the, the world of legal interpretation, that would be true. But okay. the Supreme Court's definition so, overrides that. So, right, but, but if the law as it stands, uh, if before a Supreme Court decision, if you, if you were to actually uh, hold both the previous law and the new law to simultaneously be in effect, you could not follow, you could not follow the law if you are a child. That's correct. The law is an, is an impossibility. So, so by the by the initial Supreme Court ruling, they they ruled that since both of those laws must simultaneously exist, they they in essence said you must abide by a law that it is impossible for you to abide by. That's correct, and that's why the attorneys came back the next day and said, Your Honor, we're having a little trouble doing this impossible task that you asked us to do. Right. Okay. And then they said they said we'll we'll make we'll. We'll modify it enough to make it possible for you. We, we will go against common legal terminology. As long as they can travel back in time. We will go against common legal terminology. Right, that's right. Okay. Rich. Yes. Two, two quick questions. One, doesn't the law also say that filing cannot occur from within inside of a residence, which would pose a problem with people trying to do their statement of economic interest from a location? Yeah, but we don't need to, we don't need to look for a problems. There's plenty of them out there. Well, that's another yeah. one that needs to be closed. And then last, 
in your research, could you tell this group um, who are the lawmakers responsible for this great change of law? Well, the, the sponsors, uh, they were not responsible by themselves. They can't do anything by themselves. It were Nathan Valentine and Nikki Hill. But it went through a committee. It went through both houses. It went through all the lawyers who looked at it, and nobody caught it. So, like I said, there's plenty of blame to go around. Would, would you, would it, if, if the courts had ruled now we get to under common law practice, um, there would be no problem with the new, with the with the change to the law. Right. The legislature is going to have to deal with it because this is very unwieldy. Correct. Right. But right. if they had ruled as a norm, as I expected them to rule, it would have been well, usable in that. Not as you expected them to rule, as every other right. court not in the land right. would rule. Right. As would be expected. Sure. Um, I don't understand this. Did any incumbent get kicked out? Or did they not? No, because the law says that if you are an incumbent, you already have an SEI on file. And so you are not required to file one, an, an initial one, because obviously candidates who aren't in office have never filed an SEI. So the law was designed to make it so that we could know immediately what conflicts a candidate might have as well. Now, there's no real reason it has to be done at, at that instant, but that's what the law was. I would be more interested in seeing the person who's been in there. Well, there's, there's his online. Than the new person, we don't know. Well, theirs is online. That's why they're <laughs> Yes, Senator Knott. Rich, uh, now that we uh, passed the law up there to put it under the election commission so that when a person walks into the election commission and they present their paperwork, at the time they fulfill the requirement of whatever the election law requirements are, at that time, they walk out of that office a certified candidate. Do you think that that is, uh, will, will solve this problem? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a hundred different ways they can solve it. Well, you know that we've done that. Yeah, I, I don't know that it got, it didn't get it anywhere yet, though, right? I believe it passed the House and the Senate. Well, if you all have a special session to finish that up, you can do the other suggestion I have as well. <laughs> <laughs> Did you suppose that the government because she's the only one that can call us in? All right, well, I'll get on her. You all heard that? Nikki Hill has to call. Hey, she's trying to let her. All right, anything else? Thank you, Rich. Great Rich, don't go very far away. You'll be needed. Uh, Tommy Windsor. Tommy, we have a, uh, a very special award coming up. Uh, Tommy Windsor's going to talk about it. And that's Bill and Roma Sheely Lifetime Membership Award. Well, first of all, let me say, uh, Rich, I believe you said in your comments, where are you, where did you run off to, uh, that uh, you knew that this was going to be a conflict in the law when you, you read the two, and on behalf of uh, Clay Burkett and Suzanne and myself, thanks for the phone call, buddy, we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the chance out there, Chief. say that with complete humor. Rich is a good friend of mine. Come on now. But we're trying to bring a little levity to the, to the situation here, everyone. Uh, but the, the, reason, the reason I'm here to speak tonight is about two people who are very, very uh, close to me. And uh, their name are Verona and Bill Sheely. And if you've been involved in this party for any length of time, at some point you have dealt with Bill and Verona Sheely. When I became chairman of this party in 1997, believe it or not, there was a very similar situation brewing as we've got going on here tonight, except it just involved one person. And it was somewhere we had never, we'd never trotted that ground before. And it was, it was a big, big situation. We had people calling for this person to be thrown out of the party. Well, I've got it. It was the sheriff, man. Wanted to throw him out of the party. You know, wanted, wanted to get rid of him. He was talking about running as an independent, and people wanted to throw him out of the party. And, um, you know, I was like, what in the world am I going to do here? And I tell you that story because I had I had my second mom, Verona Sheely, say, Tommy, Tommy, now just you know, let's think all this through. We'll talk about it. And I could, and Verona, if you know Verona, is very, has a flair for the dramatic sometimes. I mean, something can be kind of small, and she gets real, because she's very passionate about what she does. 
whether it be her work for Sister Care or for the party, Verona and Bill Sheely are very passionate about what they do. And I can tell you 100% without a doubt that I could not have been the Republican Party Chairman of Lexington County if I had not had Bill and Verona Sheely. Because these two people, I sat in their, their, their little bedroom office they had over at their house in Quail Hall until 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning working on the newsletter. Uh, you know, and that was a huge pressing issue. I think that probably took two or three votes, Mr. Chairman, you know, to try to get the newsletter things passed. And so, you know, we have a history of dealing with very important substantive issues here at the Lexington County Republican Party. But having said that, they are two very, very dedicated people. Two people who love this party, who have sacrificed a lot of time and energy and money, and I know even blood, sweat, and tears literally for it. And I can't think of any greater honor than to give Bill and Verona Sheely an honorary lifetime membership in the Lexington County Republican Party for all the work they've done. So Mr. Chairman, as a commitment from Hollow Creek Precinct at this time, I move that we award Bill and Verona Sheely an honorary <laughs> lifetime membership in the Lexington County Republican Party. Is there a second? Second. 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 Any objection? Here's no objection, so order. And would it please be noted for the record that it passed by unanimous consent? Passed by unanimous consent for the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I want all the other chairmen to come down front, all the other chairmen who have worked with uh, Ron and Bill need to come back down front and say a few words. They couldn't be here tonight. They, they, we, we, tried, uh, we tried to get them here. There's some health issues. Uh, Katrina will tell you about that. I, talk, I talked to Ms. Verona today, and they wanted to be here, but Mr. Bill's been having some problems with his hip. He's got two um, discs in his back that uh, he's had some problems with, and he's in a walker, so he couldn't be here. But uh, we have a resolution that, um, that we wrote, and it says, Whereas the Republican Party is dependent on people of strong moral character, with unwavering patriotism and a dedication to protecting the family and pr promoting personal responsibility, whereas Bill and Verona Sheely exemplify those qualities and have served as outstanding examples of exceptional Republican grassroots leadership, whereas Bill and Verona Sheely have been dedicated volunteers to the local, state, and national Republican Party and have donated countless hours of time and effort to strengthening the party and helping elect Republican candidates to office, whereas both individually and as a couple, Bill and Verona have been bestowed the Republican Party's most prestigious awards and honors in recognition for their superior service, be it therefore resolved that a lifetime membership to the Lexington County Republican Party be conferred upon Bill and Verona in grateful appreciation for their lifetime of service. And it's signed by Steve Isom, Chairman. They are probably the two of the hardest working people that I've ever known. And they were always there, regardless of what the problem or whether it was a happy time or what. And uh, I think Verona was probably one of the most compassionate people I've ever met in my life. And uh, she was the easiest person I know to make cry. <laughs> and, uh, I cried three times today when I talked to And uh, I too had spent some time over that. Uh, before and after I was chairman, and uh, I can't say enough about both of them, and they're two of the most devoted people to each other. If anybody would ever want to look at a marriage and how to do it, if any of you out there talking about getting married, you ought to go to sit, sit down and talk to them, because that, you will come away with a better feeling about what you're getting ready to step into when you say I do. Thank you. I uh, appreciate y'all listening to me again. Sorry about that. Um, when I first started with the party, I volunteered very naively to be the recording secretary. And uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, thankfully, I have Verona 
and Bill helped me out. They gave him the templates, and they actually did it all, and I just signed it at the bottom. But uh, if it wasn't for Corona, it wouldn't. Have, it would not have happened. And uh, and Bill was the tech guy, and uh, and this I don't know how old they were at that point. They were old enough that you wouldn't think they'd even know how to use computers, but they, they did a great job, and uh, they weren't afraid of them, and they always did all they could to help us. And I wish they were here to hear all this, but uh, hopefully they'll get a video. All right, thank you. We'll get a, a copy of the video of Ron Kilder, wherever the Sergeant at Arms is. We'll get a copy of the back. We'll get a copy of the video to them. And uh, we'll maybe get a, next month, maybe they'll, they'll Yeah, they said they were all trying to Okay. Finish. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Next, this is one of the most important items for me uh, as administrative function anyway, is election uh, for first vice chair. We have ballots, and I'd like to have, we have a group of people who will be passing out the ballots. Can we agree to do that? Ross, can you come up and get the ballot now? Oh, oh yeah, we have, we've, more, we've got three people running. Would the three individuals come up to the front of the room? Uh, Craig? Yeah, and Let's, uh, let's have you speak for, uh, Max, I know you want to prepare for this, you can once, but let's speak for two minutes. Craig Caldwell, uh, Michael Calvert, Michael, you're here somewhere. Uh, oh, Michael, you're in front. Glenn, where's Glenn? Okay, we're here. All right, all right, Craig, go ahead. Hey, my name's Craig Caldwell. i um, been a long time member of the Lexington County Republican Party. Um, been involved since I was three years old. Uh, I've got four brothers. We actually posed for Henry Master's children when he ran for lieutenant governor at the time, <laughs> and um, for some campaign collateral. But um, my my grandfather Cecil Caldwell retired from Mid Carolina Co-op, uh, was electrical engineer there, and my father Roger Caldwell was one some of the first original members of the party in the late '60s and helped organize. And um, I'm running because they need help. Um, you know, I've been, I've done a lot behind the scenes, been active in several campaigns, um, grassroots level and stuff like that, long time member of Lexington County, but there is, there needs to be some help. And um, I feel like, you know, in an effort to get our party to grow, we need to assist the chairman, assist the officers, also uh, engage the executive committee as well as all the precinct um, officers and everything into what our party is what the platform is and stand up for the right reasons. So that's why I'm doing it. I'm also not running for anything else. So this is not a springboard to another position. I'm committed to, I, I will put it down, but I will commit to finish this term and uh, you're, there's not gonna be a gap or anything in between that. So I appreciate it. <laughs> if, if that's a King James, I'll, I'll put my hand on it. But, uh, I appreciate the consideration and um, if anybody has any questions, concerns, feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, Mike. I'm Michael Calvert. Uh, I don't have any family members here except for my own. I don't have a grandfather who's from here or an uncle or anyone. My wife and I uh, chose to come here. Uh, it's been an honor to get to know everyone that we've gotten to know in the Republican Party. We've been members, both my wife and I, since we were children. I don't know if you remember the last time I was here, but uh, you know. It is an honor to meet everyone here. It's been great getting involved, uh, meeting uh, Chairman Eisen as well as some of the other people uh, on the Executive Council. And the reason I'm running is, like I told you before, um, I was asked by a couple of people who came up to me uh, and asked me to, uh, to throw my hat in. They thought that there should be some, some faces in that uh, maybe you guys haven't seen before. Maybe you're seeing some of the same faces, some of the same things happening over and over again. They thought maybe if someone came in from, with a fresh perspective and uh, was willing to really work hard and represent you guys, and uh, that uh, I should do it. So I decided to go ahead and, and throw my hat in. That's pretty much it. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mike. Yeah. 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 Good evening. My name is Glenn Miller. People call me Benny Goodman, but uh, <laughs> you don't remember the name. You know me. I've been here and I've made the meetings. I'm a familiar face to most of you uh, the last couple of years. Uh, and I enjoy these meetings, even the exciting ones. <laughs> you all know, I'm sure, 
that we're not rubber stamps for anyone holding elected office. We're all individuals with ideas about the way government should be run. We're self-selected as people who stand out from the rest to push our party in the conservative direction. I understand uh, that the county party is, first and foremost, the voice of the grassroots. We're not organized from the top down. We're organized from the people up, and we do it frequently every two years. I realize that there's less than a year left to serve, and I'm not about climbing the ladder either. <clears throat> I'm about stepping in just to serve uh, where there is a vacancy and being there for the party and the chairman when needed. I want to do a good job and hope you'll uh, allow me to serve for the remainder of this term as the first vice chairman of Lexington County Republican Party. Currently, I serve as a district vice chair of Central B. I have a working relationship with our current chairman and deal honestly and straightforward with him. I'm currently a precinct president, uh, Bethany. I'm a poll chairman at uh, Thelion II. When Joe Wilson won the election for the U.S. House of Representatives, I wrote his acceptance speech, which he later opted to just speak off the top of his head. <laughs> maybe he didn't like it. Maybe he didn't like it. <laughs> I lobbied to keep the Confederate flag flying over the Capitol. I feel it's part of history, and I feel strongly for that. Uh, previous to moving to South Carolina, I was one of six who worked with the incumbent candidate for the town supervisor, uh, uh, prepping him for his debates. Uh, by profession, I'm an insurance agent. I stand before you asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just the name of the balance to someone out there to pass out. Who has the balance to pass out? Okay. Let's get those out. You yeah. need some help? Ross? If, if you will, circle one of the three names and we'll collect those and, and count. We we'll count short. Those Oh, if you're an uh, executive committeeman or if you're a president who can vote, please stand or if you have a proxy. And make sure you turn your proxy in.
And do you know of anybody who might be interested in joining our organization or you would like to help us get out the word, tell people you know, um, see me immediately after and I'll give you my business card with my contact information. And I appreciate everything that this county party has done to support me and help me. And I know that y'all will continue to do that in the future. Thank you.
Now, next, next, since uh, we have a presentation coming up, in the presentation, uh, there's no motions, no actions, uh, no discussions, just simply a presentation of information. There will be 10 minutes allocated for complaints against the party leadership, meeting member, head holder, or call party, and they can use that time any way they wish. First, let me say that I knew nothing about this. I was not asked, nor I did make uh, a petition to speak against the party leadership. Um, my, I will, however, say that um, in all total honesty, that I was in charge of filing, and I had to say to the county elections commission that with the exception of the incumbents, Nobody followed the letter of the law as the Supreme Court ruled. Now, did it hurt some friends of mine? Yes, it did. A man who's like a son to me filed April 9th, and I had to say, I'm sorry, you didn't do it for me. So whether we were misinformed, misled, if it was a misinterpretation, whatever it is, it was my duty to say, which I did that nobody, with the exception of the incumbents, followed the letter of the law, as the Supreme Court confirmed. Now, May 4th, at about 11 o'clock, when we certified candidates to the state county election, I said, this is wrong. I will not attest to it. I will not sign that this is right. And I immediately, to the chairman, resigned my position as temporary recording secretary, his membership chair, and whatever else he'd want me to do, clean the latrine, whatever it is. And I, the statements have been said that I lied to the <coughs> court. I did not. I had no petition. I had nothing. No affidavit to the Supreme Court. So that's, mis that's well, I hate to say a lie, but it's not a true statement. I did not lie to the state executive committee. I told the truth as people who were there witnessed, I told the truth. So whether, you, whether I'm the person you love to hate, I'm sorry for that, but I'm the person charged with telling the truth and filing correctly. And that's why I resigned, not so much against the leadership, but because we had a little difference of opinion on it, right? And so that's my only statement. Again, I did not ask to be on the agenda. I did not know anything about it until I walked in and saw this. But um, whether I have complete sympathy and empathy for people who were led astray. But when our chairman was advised to take the word for it, right? And I, I almost literally screamed, no, they have to give it to me. <coughs> The law in 2010 did not vacate the law of 1996. You had to give me a paper copy with it. Now, as for the article in the Chronicle, I was, spoke as a activist, not representing the party, and I had to tell the truth. And it hurt, <coughs> it hurt a person who's like a son to me. It hurt other people that I'm fond of. But that's my only statement tonight. Um, I thank you for your attention, and um, whether you agree with me or don't agree with me, um, I've worked in this party since I was 16 years old, and I'm now 71. When I resigned from everything last year, hindsight tells me I should have stuck to my guns. So I've gotten quite a few hits, but in all honesty, I had to tell the truth, and I'm in complete, again, sympathy and empathy with those who were left off the ballot. They have been done a misjustice. But I'm sorry, those who were with me that morning, some um, Carla and Ross Snell and Ned Carl, we were there, and I almost literally was screaming, no, no, you have to tell them, they have to give me a copy of it. But the instructions from higher up were, no, take the word for it. So that's all I need to say. And again, I apologize, I didn't know I was going to be on the agenda, so I'm not prepared to speak, except from the heart. I thank you so much. Thank you. Sure, I've just got one great comment. Um, I learned that I was going to be in the agenda, the steering committee meeting last week, and uh, 
really all I, I my only point in what I've been trying to do in this party is that nobody, no matter what their political ideals, no matter what their uh, position on issues, they should always be given the right to speak. And I will stand up for the right for people to speak to the death. And that's all I've done. And I've been denied the right to speak, and that was wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I didn't ask to be on your agenda tonight. And, I'm, and, and any complaints that I had against management uh, of the party were dealt with when I resigned my position as uh, the reporting secretary, which I did at the end of the meeting on May the 7th. Uh, the only problem I've had since then is that I did write the minutes for the May meeting, and I wrote them from my notes from when the meeting was actually going on, and they were ignored. And tonight, the minutes have been presented to you, to you on the back table with uh, the new recording secretary's name on them. And they are almost exactly my minutes, if you take my minutes and match them up. So they're still my minutes, and I was the recording secretary that night, not real. Okay, so uh, anything else? Anything else? Okay. Uh, thank you for... Uh, and be the staff I just read it. So thank you for doing that. Um, next, we have a rough week of recognition of the award effort that this is the most interesting story. And I would ask uh, Chief uh, the Western County Sheriff's Office, Chief Kirshner, and he talked about uh, like Russ made the front page one day, something like that. He did. That's right. Yeah, Keith Kirshner, I'm the Chief Deputy of Lexington Sheriff's Office. I work with uh, direct for Sheriff Beth for the past 40 some odd years. I uh, also serve as the uh, president elect for the SCLEOA, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Officers Association. We've been in existence since 1941. And what we do is we try to protect the interests of the citizens, the public safety, and the welfare of the citizens of the state of South Carolina by having a strong association. We also protect the interests of law enforcement officers across the state. We support legislation and uh, funding that will help us protect the public. So what we also like to do, and many other things that we do with the association, um, what we like to do each and every year is recognize a citizen for their heroic efforts and an officer every year for their heroic efforts, essentially. And um, we have a representative nominated from each district for both. And we recognize those folks, like I said, once a year. Normally do that at the Congress, and this year we did it, last year's event, we did it at a special luncheon, which we held last Thursday. Um, the officer was the chief of police at the Monroe Police Department, and his was really for outstanding efforts over a career, the things that he's really done for to improve his community. Uh, his chief Fowler, I believe was his name. This year's citizen, um, there were nominees from all, almost each and every district throughout the state. This year, citizen, I have to tell you that I uh, served on the committee to determine who the winner would be. And I, it was clear to me, and obviously to others, that Mr. Wheat, Russell Wheat, what should be uh, the winner for 2011 for the Citizen of the Year. Because what he did was truly heroic. There was a deputy in Richland County uh, who had encountered a number of people and uh, performance of his duties. I think he was on a call for service. And while he was there, they became very argumentative, uh, even combative. And the deputy's life, and uh, certainly his uh, well-being was in jeopardy. Uh, most citizens, well, maybe that's not true. I think there are citizens who would just drive on by. And I always know I was in a situation that, like that myself a very long time ago where a young man got the best of me. The citizen stopped and asked, do you need help? And I said, uh, well, I can't repeat what I said. But get over here, help. <laughs> <laughs> he helped me, and uh, he and another man helped me. And uh, that situation would have turned out much differently. Unfortunately, he wasn't recognized for that. In fact, I don't know that that man's name. I wish I did. But Mr. Mr. Reed saw it, and uh, he helped that option. And that situation, I'm sure, would have turned out much worse than the deputy uh, that was there at the scene. Um, not only did he sacrifice his time, a lot of folks just aren't willing to do that anymore. He sacrificed, potentially sacrificed his, could have sacrificed his life, and so unfortunately he did not, and his well-being. Just as that officer swore to do to serve and protect, he didn't do that. He just drove by and stopped and helped the guy out. 
And uh, I wish there were more folks like him because uh, we do our best to bond with the Department of the Community and those that we serve. Mr. Russell, we certainly deserve to do that. And the, the situation turned out well. A number of folks that were there causing the officer a problem uh, were arrested. I think they even found that some of them had warrants against them already. So for that, the uh, South Carolina Law Enforcement Officers Association recognized Mr. Russell to be the citizen of the year for 2009. <laughs> Not in a courtroom, but by voting people. 
And that's what I'm concentrating on. That's all I have to time to concentrate on. There are those of you in this room who su support Senator Knotts. Just like I, I, I expect you to respect him, and I expect you to respect me and the people that support me. I ask you to make the decision on how to vote based on what your constant conscience dictates and not based on anything that you feel personally towards me or to, towards Mr. Knotts. I want to encourage you to let your heart and your mind make the decision based on what's best for the Lexington County Republican Party and not for um, anything else. Thank you. Everybody else in this room to start, 
and I would like to see this resolution not discussed, put aside, and just let's move forward and try to advance the cause of conservative government in the election. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. The, the chair is interpreting Mr. Windsor's comments as a motion to postpone indefinitely. That motion requires a second. It is not debatable. It is, it is seconded. It is not debatable. It requires a majority vote for adoption. The vote will proceed immediately. And if the motion is adopted, then this resolution is killed. If you agree with the resolution, you should vote no. If you if you want the motion postponed indefinitely, you should vote yes. And a motion a vote should be taken right now. Stand up and vote yes to postpone.
I'm sure this is on the website. If there's no objections, uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, approve the judge's report as submitted. Not hearing the objections, it's been uh, approved. Next, we have I make the approval minutes, May and June, executive session minutes, uh, will this board as those minutes. Uh, I, I do have a comment. I, yes. I do want you to know, Carla, that I'm addressing to some hearsay but to, if you're going to do settle that, that shouldn't you stipulate in here that car I, the way i would have done the minutes was i would have done it and i would have stipulated in my minutes that carla Harmon resigned at the end of that meeting or Harmon resigned at the end of that meeting or whatever and i would have stipulated that and stated that in my minutes and, and basically reflected that and that is a review of what she had also that is absolutely right that. that's exactly what should happen in, in my parliamentary and, and i think I've that's a, minutes for years and i think that's you're right and i think that's essentially what ms lindler has proposed and I, I suppose that the motion's on the floor to do that at the moment i believe it states that in the last it says in the form of that vote, motion to suspend the rules. If the form was met, the vote was taken, and the suspension of the rules was not passed. And that's what I well, Could we ask the court secretary to go back and see the video for that accuracy? We'll say that again. I apologize. The, the minutes state that the vote was taken except to suspend the vote on the resolution when in, in actuality the vote was taken to suspend the rules and it did not happen. Okay. 
So that correction is to be Well, ma'am, ask a question. Is that a correction to the minutes proposed by Ms. Sto Story or the minutes from Ms. Harris? That's, that's a different one about her. That's, okay, well then. That's then, a different one. Then what's on the floor at the moment is consideration of Ms. Harvey's minutes. Yes, yeah, that's a different one. Okay, we, I think the point is that we've got changes that Carla wants to have made that reflect her original minutes. Now, Bill, are, are you in agreement with this? I am fine with how everyone do it. Okay, let's let's vote. We want to keep. Okay, let's all in favor of uh, Mickey's uh, motion. Please stand. <coughs> silent auction, we'll have trophies for the people, we'll have um, 
flea market tables, it's a, and it, every penny goes to help these young people. Um, my daughter-in-law trains horses and uh, riders, and um, it's just an excellent thing. And it is called the Dream Riders because every one of these children has a dream of being able to sit on a horse with a helmet and make that horse go. So I'm not asking for any money. I'm just saying I'm sponsoring a team. And I'd love to have all the elected officials either come and play or send a representative. If you come play, representing the party, every one of us here, I just need 12 people. And Sheriff, you can stand at the back and make them sign up as we need. Right? <laughs> Once again, it's something that our Sheriff helps the community. Okay. He expects his people to be involved, and he is, so thank you. Thank you. Is that play softball? So, okay. Women and men. No, I was like, no worse, but I just wanted to make sure it was possible. Okay, any other announcements? Look, look, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. It's been a, a long meeting. It's after 9 o'clock, and we've got a lot of work to do. We'd love to see you back here in August. Thank you for coming out. Thanks, folks. Thank you. 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 Oh, I'm